All right. Hope everybody can see that PowerPoint. Yes. We're going to go ahead and get started. So good morning, everyone. This is a workshop. And by that, we want to make sure it's a dynamic workshop, which means we'll have uh, pretty much open participation. So everybody defaults on mute. But if you have a question or you want to jump in on something, um, we're going to try to make this more of a, a conversation. So feel free anytime to jump in. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and introduce my, my colleagues here helping me. So Adam Shelley is the environmental project managers for uh, the Center for Human Ge Geoenvironmental Studies. That's the center that I direct here at WKU. Uh, we are involved in a lot of different projects and various things uh, related to the topic, which is uh, fancy titled Tools and Techniques for Urban Karst Hydrology and Hazard Monitoring and Management. Uh, basically, we're going to be talking about some of the work we've been doing to develop different types of techniques and data management processing and tools related back to a lot of the work here in Bowling Green, Kentucky, where we have an extensive urban karst landscape. We've got quite a lot of different groundwater issues and things that we've worked on for over a decade now and in, on the legacy of Nick Crawford and, and Chris Groves and others trying to, to build and maybe advance a little bit some of those different methods and practices using the newest technology and, and uh, hopefully some of the, the newer, more exciting ways that you can actually use and analyze these data. So um, Adam and I are gonna try to do what we can to bring that all to life here during this workshop. I um, also have uh, another staff, Keegan McClanahan, who's out there with Adam helping out, um, who's doing some camera work and uh, also experienced and worked on helping set up some of this before um, in the in past years. So I think collectively our knowledge hopefully will be enough to really bring it together. Uh, so those guys are kind of hanging out in the background over there and uh, also available to answer questions and whatnot as we move through this. So we're going to do our best to try to, to keep things moving slowly and smoothly. So if you see here this picture now, um, you're looking at a site called Lost River Rise. Some of you are familiar with it or may have visited in the past. Um, this is a picture of the site back in the 1980s. You see a, a bridge across it here that looks a little bit sketchy, but uh, safe enough for grad students anyways. And you see some uh, PVC piping and a stilling well kind of set up and whatnot. This was uh, back in the Nick Crawford days when he originally set up some monitoring. And so we've continue that and we still are at that site. We'll actually have some live feed from that site here in a little bit once we get to that point. Um, and, and we'll show you now what it looks like and how we've modernized this process due to the technology and advances that we've been able to take advantage of here in the last few years. So uh, general format for the workshop is we're gonna basically do water quality and quantity for the first hour or so. And then we're gonna move to data management applications and outcomes for the last 30 minutes or so. Um, rough timeline, but just to give you an idea, and we'll try to add in a lot of time for discussions throughout. So we'll start with that question, just as a good good kind of primer. Big question a lot of folks asked, and what we started with are, what are the primary monitoring and data collection challenges? Um, urban cars, groundwater is a little bit different. Um, you've got different types of infrastructure, impacts, uh, things to worry about from vandalism to, to development to land use and landowner relationships. So um, that's kind of the question that we're gonna try to to talk about answer. Um, and again, if anybody has any, any thoughts or questions or input, feel free to chime in at any point in time during this. So um, these questions are ones we're going to answer in the workshop, but also prompts uh, to jump in anytime if you have thoughts or questions or any kind of comments or, or anything you want to jump in with. So for us, the things we identify are obviously collecting data is a challenge. And for that, it, it boils down to a few different topics. One is equipment selection. That's always a, an interesting thing. There's a lot of different options out there on the market. There's a lot of different advances. So you get the newest, fanciest thing. And then next month, there's another one that comes out. And of course, always more expensive. Um, another challenge is site installs. A thing we've worked a lot on over the last uh, five, six years is trying to figure out creative ways to get site installs done and whatnot. And so we've got a couple new things there that we can talk about. Uh, technology needs is always an interesting one. Um, a lot of different ways to, to use the technology. And that includes everything from collecting the data, but also to migrating it to different places, um, whether that's streaming it back real time to the lab or moving it from the equipment to the computer and being able to process it that way. And then we have metadata and methods. Um, so obviously not just the equipment, but uh, the things we need to understand about the sites, about the data, 
the types of ways that we process it through and the, the parameters and whatnot we need to collect. And then things like hold times. We'll talk a little bit about some of the actual on-site sampling for water quality um, and some of the challenges there when you're dealing with some of these different locations. And then for analyzing, uh, compiling is a big deal once you can, you can start to collect thousands of data points like we can now with, with advanced loggers and, and different types of songs. And then storing the data, having a place to actually store it all and be able to access it, uh, processing it, different types of software we'll talk about. And then the last part, sharing and visualizing. Uh, what do you do when you have all this information and how do you process it in a way that's useful for people and you can visualize it for people who might be interested like stakeholders, city government, county, other researchers, the general public, that sort of thing. So we'll start with water quality. We'll just jump into it. So a lot of the issues we deal with here are stormwater quality issues. Um, sedimentation is a big one. Uh, obviously garbage, trash, you know, pollution, that sort of thing of uh, the general nature that you get on the surface. Specifically, we have obviously point and non-point source pollutants. Um, so it's a little bit different even in the urban karst areas, we still have non-point source pollutants. Uh, they, they come in quite a bit from land use changes, whether it's development or oil spills, uh, gas leaks, industrial runoff. And then we occasionally get point source uh, that comes in sometimes we get straight pipe septics. Like in Bowling Green, we still have a lot of septics. Uh, and in Bowling Green, even though we're obviously urbanized and have a pretty advanced uh, sewer system, we still have folks like that who are on these. And of course they like to drill them down into the car straight into a, a fracture or something that goes into a stream. And uh, if you're unfortunate enough to come across one of those in the cave, the smell alone will remind you that it's there. And so some of the other impacts you can see here in this table, obviously we have a lot of negative impacts due to land use change. Uh, one of the big things in an urban setting that differs from a rural is that you have rapid change. Um, always a new development, always a, a new thing coming it happens quite a bit here in Bowling Green and uh, of course anywhere else. And then we have other things that are a little different that you might see uh, outside of rural areas and urban areas, which would be things like potential for antibiotic resistant bacteria, which I'll talk about, um, you know, from human waste and the, the types of antibiotics that we use that make it into the stream of waste that goes eventually into the groundwater system if it's not managed well uh, for, for being able to move that waste to where it needs to be treated. So we'll work on that. That's something we've been working on recently. And then the common groundwater pollutants you see on apples, de apples, trash, sediment, um, chemicals, fertilizers, obviously a lot of nutrient runoff from lawn care, lots and lots of different things. So a uh, pretty extensive suite of potential things. Um, we can't monitor for all of them, but we try. And then sampling and site selection. This is a Bowling Green dye trace map uh, being compiled from 1970 up until now. We're still currently working on that and monitoring and, and working through different uh, ways to refine those groundwater boundaries. So those green dashed lines kind of identify multiple boundaries here and all the red lines indicate dye traces that have been conducted in successful ways to connect point to point. And then we have over on the, the right here, some of the different things we try to, to take into consideration. So trying to consider what types of data are being collected already, how frequently they need to be collected, um, what types of, of parameters to monitor for, you know, which, which suite we want to have. Are they indicators? Are they exploratory? Do we have specific issues that we want to do? Um, we try to take into consideration the types of sites, which range from springs to injection wells to uh, in-cave streams, to any kind of potential type of input or output in the karst system. And of course, in Bowling Room, we've got a lot of those. We've got a lot of those. We've got Nice springs here in the city that are sometimes pretty big, but also small ones that dot around the landscape. We've got obviously lots and lots of injection wells and other things that way that intersect the groundwater. And we have surface water features. Uh, so we've got quite a few things that I'll talk about here in a little bit. And then we talk about site installs. We have to think a lot about how we can do it safely in a place where you might have human traffic. Um, so we have a planning aspect of it, which normally is in partnership with various entities for us. We do a lot with the city of Bowling Green, but also with private landowners, um, industrial folks, commercial landowners, that sort of thing. So trying to get access, um, you never know who's gonna actually own the feature, the, the well, the spring that you need to get access to, to do good monitoring and good data collection. Um, Safety is a huge aspect of it, obviously, particularly due to some of the sites and the fact that uh, they can be flooded easily. Uh, in an urban setting, we see some really nice flooding here in this picture. This is a Great example where you see uh, 
the cave called Bypass Cave, which is just off one of the main thoroughfares here in Bowling Green. And you can see the apartment construction being done just feet from the entrance of the cave. And you can see this under a, a fairly mo moderate rain event, um, flooding that cave out to the ceiling. Um, a lot of sediment runoff, a lot of, lot of dangerous things going on all in that one picture because um, it's not really inaccessible to anybody. Anybody could go in there, climb over one of those, those railings from that apartment and go hang out in the cave. Um, it's about a thousand feet long. There's a bunch of, of access there. So we have to think about safety um, it's for our monitoring sites too, for, for our own safety, but others as well. Um, and we adapt to the conditions. We've had a lot of different things we've had to adapt to. Uh, when you're trying to do this, things do change. Uh, we did not have an apartment building above that cave being built when we started monitoring, but it obviously changed and it was approved despite our best efforts to, to try to stop that. Um, development's gonna occur, so we have to work around that. And then sustainability and site maintenance. Uh, upkeep's a big one, making sure that we can actually keep up the sites, maintain access, maintain our infrastructure. Um, it's, it's an ongoing challenge. Even in an urban area, uh, we still have to do a lot of upkeep and maintenance. And then stock at Home Depot, I like to say, is a good one too, because uh, it's, it's not cheap to put some of this infrastructure together. So uh, it takes a lot of materials, a lot of supplies, a lot of coordination. We'll talk about some of those when we show our sites. So another prompt then, um, from which types of sites do we typically collect data and for what parameters? So I'm gonna jump in and again, anybody can chime in if you have questions or comments. Uh, a little bit about what, what types of sites we monitor at and the types of data we collect there. So the types of data, we typically collect our basic geochemistry because those are easily done with SONs. Uh, pH, temperature, specific conductivity, dissolved oxygen, turbidity. Uh, occasionally we can collect another parameter or two using uh, the SONs. Uh, they've, they've come a long way where we can actually have dye probes, um, nitrate, that sort of thing, which we don't do as continuously. Um, we don't do it all sites, but for these parameters, we pretty much collect continuous data. And then we also get water quality data. And that typically comes in in the form of doing grab samples, um, going out and collecting for bacteria like E. coli, which is a great indicator bacteria uh, for potential water quality impacts from human waste or, or other types of manure waste. Oil and grease, which is a real big issue and problem in an urban area. Um, biological oxygen demand, metals, nutrients. So pretty much a classic suite of water quality data uh, that you can get easily through grab samples and get analyzed fairly quickly uh, without too much problem in a lab. And then of course, we also do water quantity. We'll talk about that some. A lot of times that gets built into the data collection with the SONs. So we collect water level and then we'll do discharge measurements, create rating curves and, and be able to convert all that over. So we get good continuous discharge. <clears throat> so we can look at things like loadings of these different parameters and try to understand more about water quality as, as we see conditions change um, with the different sites. And then we do a lot of environmental or meteorological collection as well. Um, things like rainfall amount, obviously, barometric pressure we use, and I'll talk about that a little bit, um, wind speed, soil moisture, etc. So we try to collect other data that we use um, for additional calculations and ways that we tie to, to back to the water quality and quantity, which I'll, I'll describe a little bit later on as well. So some of the things we're going to talk about today, just as a preview, is we right now for water level pretty much use hobo pressure transducer loggers. Um, really nice, self-contained, easy to use, uh, fairly inexpensive, um, not too difficult to maintenance. Uh, really don't need maintenance other than having to clean them and occasionally change them out uh, if they've been there for years and the battery may start to die. So they work really well. Um, we use Nexens V2 real-time loggers that are the way we, we transmit our data back via cellular telemetry to our sites. And that's usually from our exosons. So we typically use YSI exo uh, one or two sons to collect the data for our, our basic geochemistry and, and water quality parameters. And those are transmitted back to us real time using the next sense logger. So those are coupled. We do have some additional uh, pressure transducers that we use now from uh, Onset Hobo that we are now set up that are real time as well and will transmit via cellular telemetry. So we'll have a few of those sites. And then meteorological parameters, we have a lot of different things we, we collect using uh, also Hobo weather stations. And one of the things we'll talk about a little bit is network density. Um, we've got quite a few weather stations around the city of Bowling Green. Um, it turns out that our spatial distribution of rainfall is pretty varied. 
And so for those, we typically collect surface temperature, rainfall amount, uh, barometric pressure, relative humidity, solar radiation, wind speed and direction, uh, soil moisture and soil temp for some sites. Obviously the one in the picture was on the public works building downtown Bowling Green on the roof. We don't collect soil moisture and temp there because it's all urbanized and concrete and asphalt. Uh, but other sites where we can, we do uh, collect soil moisture and temperature and we use all those to help us look at things like evapotranspiration. So switch a little bit more to the parameters, what are best suited for water quality. So in addition to the things that we can monitor and collect data on pretty easily using loggers or automated sons, we also have things we need to collect by hand. And that includes a whole suite of basic water quality parameters we try to do on a regular basis in coordination with the city of Bowling Green. Uh, they do an ambient water monitoring program. And we overlap some of those same sites of a lot of the work we do through research. And that's basically looking at um, BOD, COD, metals, um, you know, anions, so nutrients, so looking at phosphates, nitrates, that sort of thing, uh, heavy metals, um, oil and grease, E. coli bacteria, which is our, our common indicator. Um, recently, we've been doing work with the antibiotic resistant genes or antibiotic resistant bacteria, what we call superbugs, and then other things as needed. So we'll also collect things like uh, total organic carbon, or we'll occasionally go out and look for, for additional things or run suites of, of parameters in case we run into other contaminants. Uh, so in addition to oil and grease, we might look at VOCs or other things if we think there might be a additional concern in some places. Just to dump into the, the antibiotic resistant genes because it's kind of novel and new and interesting, I think. So we're looking basically at bacteria in water that's developed resistance to antibiotics uh, due to some exposure to them in the environment. So as we take antibiotics or as we have different types of, of other animals that may be, may be treated with antibiotics, anything in that, that waste stream from the animals or us that makes it down into the groundwater contributes trace amounts of those antibiotics and as those build up in that water system, the natural bacteria in there like E. coli, salmonella, et cetera, will start to build a resistance to it um, over time. And it's really common and something that's being done a lot in wastewater treatment. Uh, obviously groundwater, particularly in karst areas, is not as is often looked at or worried about because it's out of sight, out of mind. So we started looking at this uh, sort of a first go, especially here knowing we had uh, already some water quality issues and a lot of bacterial content in some of our, our groundwater systems. And so we know that using, using these techniques, we can actually detect the, the traces and concentrations of these antibiotic resistant bacteria. Uh, we've done, done quite a bit now. And of course, if you drink that water or if it's not treated well, and it's shown that the treatment process in the drinking water system um, continues to have to battle that challenge to be able to treat well against these types of superbugs uh, because they're developing resistance to some of the treatment methods, even chlorine. Then, of course, if you ingest them, it'll be something that we would potentially cause harm to you and uh, death even. So something interesting. And the other thing we'll talk about just briefly on this is just sampling and monitoring resolution. And I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but um, you know, for some of these things, we collect more high resolution, others lower. Uh, we try to do things. Uh, the city ambient is at least quarterly for some of their water sampling uh, that's done by hand. A lot of our sawn collection data we're doing at one or 10 minute resolution. Uh, we also do storm event particular sampling uh, to capture first flush events and things where we would actually get a good indication of pulses of contaminants that come through since car systems are so flashy. Um, and then we try to distribute our sites in a way spatially that makes sense that allow us to get a good handle of what's happening across different basins and sort of the broader urban landscape. And that takes a little bit of footwork ahead of time and being able to delineate those basins and understand uh, the best places to monitor, which I'll talk about a tool we've developed on that here in a little bit. So just to jump into some case study examples, we're gonna obviously focus on Bowling Green. Here's a map of the basins that we currently look at and, and work within in Bowling Green. And you can see here in purple, Lost River Cave System. Obviously it's our extensive cave system here, uh, several kilometers worth of cave that run underneath the city, underneath some of our, our main um, shopping centers and buildings and a couple of our main streets. So fairly extensive and of course the notable feature is that there is a, a nice cave tour you can take. It's a boat ride into the cave. Uh, so it's obviously water filled. We've got a nice river running through there and you can take a boat tour into a portion of it. And that's been around for a long, long time here in the city is a, a common tourist attraction. And then if you extend out, you'll see that basin is actually fairly large 
here it's, it's over 100 square kilometers of recharge and that comes from mixed land use so we have a lot of industrial over here and commercial work that, that's part of that recharge Oops. and then we have a lot of uh, other residential inputs that come in and then of course we also have some ag that come into that basin because it's so big and then if you look at the smaller basins in Bowling Green, we've got a lot of these smaller basins that tie in things like our airport, uh, shopping mall, WKU, our campus here, um, some of the more dense downtown developments of Bowling Green, some of the historic district and some of the industrial areas uh, that are on the other side of town over here to the, the north and to the west. So we've got a lot of different things going on land use wise and, wise and a few different basins that have been delineated for us to focus on as we do our monitoring and sampling so that we can understand differences in those basins and some of the land use and how best to capture any water quality issues. So just a quick overview of our monitoring network. Um, we're going to talk about this in pieces. Um, so I've got it all combined here for water quality, water quantity, and then some of the environmental parameters. So water quality right now we've got real-time monitoring. Um, we have five sites up now. We've got a sixth site going in uh, right now. All those data are being captured at 10 minute resolution. And I'll talk about what they are here in a minute. And then, of course, we also do weekly uh, water quality sampling at some of those sites. We've done quite an extensive uh, weekly sampling for a lot of different parameters over the last few years. I think quarterly the city does this as well. Uh, they do their, their ambient sampling at, at several of the same sites. And then for water quantity, we have real-time water level monitoring. It'll be at five sites, uh, one minute resolution. And we'll talk about the, the resolution difference there and why that's much higher. And then we have some static water level monitoring where we have to manually go out and collect those data uh, instead of being able to have it real-time streamed at about 27 different sites. And uh, that's a, a suite of sites that includes wells, it includes springs, um, various different types of, of water features. And then for environmental parameters right now, we're working to install another set of gauges uh, that are inclusive of 10 real-time rain gauges, um, three additional that would be manual downloads, uh, those are tied to our real-time weather stations, which are actually full weather stations that include all the parameters I listed before uh, that are collected at those and that's three different sites. Um, those are all done at one minute resolution as well. So I want to take you on a tour of Bowling Green now. So this is the city of Bowling Green. We're going to do a little aerial flyover. Um, we're about 125,000 residents. Um, the city itself is a little over 100 square kilometers in size uh, for the urbanized uh, main part of the, the city limits of Bowling Green. We're an MS4, uh, Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, Phase 2 community. So we are not required to do any kind of monitoring or water quality analysis or sampling for uh, any kind of groundwater inputs via storm sewer. So we have a pretty extensive stormwater uh, setup here that involves mainly the use of injection wells. So we've got to date uh, over, over 2,000 injection wells um, that are just basically boreholes drilled straight into the limestone until a fracture is reached uh, or a cave stream. And so here's our monitoring network. Throughout the city, we've got several sites. Um, one of these sites here is at the Barron River Bridge on I-65, right just, just to the, the edge of the city. We've got a site there that you can see the picture of. It's one of our sites that captures things upstream of our drinking water intake. And this is one of our only surface water monitoring sites, with the Barren River being one of the, the largest um, spring-fed or groundwater-fed rivers in our region. And if we zoom back out to the city, map here you'll be able to follow as we go across. So the next site we have is our new spring monitoring site. So this is a small spring, and so on the other side of the city, this actually takes recharge from most of the downtown historic district <clears throat> and it's uh, fairly small but it does get pretty decent flow during certain storm events um, and that's a, a great site we've done a lot of work in it's a fairly small basin uh, not not real large so easy for us to really concentrate some efforts there and we'll talk about some, some pretty interesting stuff we've done there with water level monitoring on that small basin and then if we move to the other side of the city here a little bit to the south <clears throat> you'll see Lost River. So this is the uh, main last resurgence blue hole that comes from the Lost River cave system that I showed a map of earlier. And then we monitor at that site where we have a, a resurgence that flows and then eventually sinks back into the cave system where the tour takes place. So you can see in the photos there, it's a, a beautiful blue hole, really great monitoring site. And 
And then we'll zoom out to the other side, <clears throat> which is kind of the, the sort of southeastern part of the city where you have uh, here probably our most sort of industrial urbanized site. This is something called Carverwell Cave. So it's a pretty extensive cave. It runs underneath a, a few different strip malls. Um, it, it takes a lot of recharge from our actual main mall site. And we're going to do a little bit extra on this one. We're going to take you in, inside on this one so you can actually see that site. Um, it's kind of an interesting one. It's basically a big uh, retention basin that was designed and developed around the entrance to the cave. And uh, we built our monitoring site into that. So you see some grading there to block out some of the debris that comes in from that retention basin because it drains a fairly large, fairly large parking lot. Um, it takes a lot from the mall across the street. And you'll see a couple of risers in here that were set up to stabilize the cave entrance. And then we're going to actually just go down hole into the cave. And from there, you can actually see where we enter the limestone, uh, sort of the natural entrance to it. Uh, the PVC pipe you'll see on the side is where we have our, our YSI EXO instrument. And then you can see obviously a flowing stream that's only about a foot deep under base flow conditions, but it does open up into a crawlway and you can go back into to over a thousand feet of cave uh, that's sort of crawly and, and uh, tight, but it does take on a fairly advanced amount of water flow during uh, big storm events. That water will rise pretty quickly. So kind of an interesting and different site that you wouldn't expect to see if you were just wandering around out in the downtown part of Bowling Green unaware of the fact that we have these features everywhere, everywhere throughout the city, um, sometimes in places we didn't even know, which uh, I'll talk about a project later. So, so here they are taking some, some uh, actual water quality samples with a baler. Uh, filling up oil and grease sample. And it's clear, but it's not necessarily clean. So we'll zoom out and we'll go to our final site here. It's on the other side of town. So if you zoom back over to the other side of Bowling Green, um, just out, outside of that, that little delineation of uh, the city limits we have the Lost River Rise site, or the site where we have uh, our main monitoring site for the entirety of the Lost River watershed. So uh, where the blue hole sinks back into the cave and flows underground for, for a little bit more of distance, it comes back out of the resurgence here called Lost River Rise, um, which is the ultimate outlet and the water eventually flows from there into Jennings Creek, which goes into the Barren River uh, downstream of our other monitoring site. And so what we're going to do now is zoom into this one, but we're going to zoom in live out to Adam and Keegan, and they're going to actually take you through and show you some of the instrumentation up close. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and hit the button here to discussion. I'm going to escape out of the PowerPoint for a moment, and then I'm going to give control back over here to them. All right, Keegan, if you could turn on your video, you will have Control, there we go. Hello everyone, everyone can hear me? Hopefully. Put yep. the camera down uh, here. So they are appropriately yes, yes, we can we can hear you. Awesome. Great. They're masked and socially distanced, so um, this is basically gonna start out at the rise um, where we're gonna walk down the hill. So we actually have this site interestingly located right next to our uh, local water utility lift station, uh, which has a nice pleasant smell on a day like today. So they're going to make their way down the hill here. The video is going to lag just a little bit more than the previous because of the fact that it's live. But as you approach the site, basically you'll see straight ahead uh, our new water site set up. It's a little different than the, the bridge and the setup uh, that was there back by Dr. Crawford in the day. Uh, this was set up and OSHA compliant through the city of Bowling Green. Uh, we've got the, the chain link fence and the, the barbed wire, and we've got an elevated platform you'll see better from down below where you can actually get into this uh, a site. So we're going to take a quick right and go down the hill. We're going to go look at the feature itself first, and then we'll come back up and dig into the, the site and some of the things going on up there. So we've modified this site for access. This is located in a park. It's located in a public park that the, the city owns and controls. So we have fairly decent safety and security here. Uh, we do have folks like to come out and swim in the spring. We come out typically and whenever we see them, we just let them know what the water quality is and then they usually jump out and run, hustle away pretty quickly. 
So we've got a hand line, and then over here you see our PVC stilling well down into the spring. Um, nice blue color today. We've had a few rains, but the water's down and uh, not too blown out with mud and sediment. So the platform is, is basically suspended using a counterweighted concrete. Um, fortunately, nobody's used it as a diving platform, even though we thought they might. Um, we've got a staff gauge out there that we use for recording measurements. We do a lot of discharge at this site. And then you can see the spring run there is probably about 15, 18 feet wide during base flow, which is about what it is now. Um, typically runs only about, about two to three feet deep on average, so about a meter deep. And it just depends on flowing conditions as to whether or not our, uh, our sond is fully submerged or only partially submerged um, at the lowest base flow. We're just in the water here. Uh, we've had to do a couple adjustments at the site to make sure that happens because things change. The, the cave changes, the sedimentation inside of it changes, uh, various stuff uh, that, that we have no control over. Or we'll design the site, set it up, and it's perfectly okay and in the water for a year or two, and then all of a sudden things will change um, via climate, via whatever, and we'll have to go out and move the stilling well and recalibrate everything to make sure that our, our instrumentation's in the water. So that's the stilling well. We're going to go up top now. Keegan's going to take us back up there to the platform where we'll actually look at uh, some of the things inside of the, the setup. So we'll start out over the stilling well. We'll basically go over here and take a look at uh, our YSI XO setup and our instrumentation. We've also got a, a pressure transducer set up here for redundancy to capture water level. So Adam's going to pull it up. So basically we've got PVC with a cap. It's got a lock on it. Uh, we've got our, our cable that goes to our real time as well as another cable uh, that's there that connects to the XO. Um, this site we're looking at a fairly short distance for PVC. So this is the YSI XO2 song. Fairly basic song. Um, Really nice polymer, lightweight, strong, um, able to be deployed for months at a time without calibration or maintenance. Uh, we typically do maintenance calibration uh, once a month. And then you can see here the, the suite of SON uh, probes that we have. And for this one, in, in all our sites, it includes pH, temperature, specific conductivity, um, dissolved oxygen, turbidity. And then in the middle, you see that kind of weird looking thing, it's a wiper. So there's actually a built-in wiper that will spin every 10 minutes and also clean off uh, the, the uh, probes on this sawn so that they stay uh, clean and able to record data because a lot of these are optical probes. Um, so they're measuring things a little bit differently uh, than some of the old probes. And so we basically keep these things maintained and, and up. And we don't really have too many issues. We, we actually have really good reliability with these exosons. We've tried a lot of different ones uh, in the past, we've, we've experimented with various different ones, and there's other excellent ones out there um, that you can get if you want a sort of cheaper version of the EXO. They have uh, great songs through Eureka, uh, in situ, trollers, a bunch of different ones. We've had a lot of good success with these, though. We work with Fondress Environmental, which is a, a distributor of, of YSI uh, up in Ohio. And so they've worked with YSI uh, to be able to couple with the EXO song uh, the real-time telemetry system, which is what we'll move to next. So we use these NextSense real-time telemetry systems that are basically set up to interface directly with the ExoSond. Um, so inside that traffic control box, we actually have a NextSense uh, setup, which I think you saw in the previous picture uh, that I, we had at this site. So it's basically just a, a telemetry logger that can take all of the data that is, is communicated from the sond into that logger and then it can redirect it via cellular telemetry to us uh, wherever we are you know, to our computer so that we can process those data and receive them without having to go out and download it with a laptop. Um, if we do download it, the XOs are nice. Uh, they have Bluetooth connectivity, um, really quick, really easy. Uh, so we, we have multiple ways we can get the data in the field under different conditions. And for this one, fortunately, it's built up in a way we don't have any issues with flooding. Uh, we've never had any problems with that. And uh, the traffic control box is nice and secure and good and set up for this. Um, still works with cellular telemetry even though it's inside the box. And then it's actually not solar powered. This one's electric powered because we have a connection with the, uh, the water utility lift station just up the hill. So this one's actually set up um, to have regular, regular 110 electric power 
but most of our other sites are actually solar powered telemetry. So they're just solar powered um, for the telemetry station. And then the SOMB itself is battery powered with D batteries, um, which lasts for quite a while. And we change those out every few months. We do deep cleans about every three months. Uh, where we'll pull the SOMBs, bring them back, and we'll do a full deep clean um, and keep the maintenance of those good. And we'll make sure that we have good calibration. So that is our real-time site set up at the rise. Keegan, Adam, anything you all want to add? Well, are there anything I missed? I think we're good. You got you covered it all. How's the weather out there today? Beautiful. Hey, it looks nice. It looks nice. For doing field work, you can't complain. <laughs> we appreciate it. We're going to go ahead and uh, switch you off the live feed, and we're going to go back to the presentation piece. We'll see you all shortly. So at this point, does anybody have any questions, thoughts, discussion, or anything before we switch to the next phase of water quantity? Uh, we're doing fairly good on time. So I wanted to stop and see if anybody had anything they wanted to talk about or, or any questions about anything we've discussed so far. I don't see anything coming up and don't hear anything, so we'll just keep moving on. So next phase of this is water quantity. Um, this is a little bit different and kind of interesting, I think, in something that we do here um, where we've got uh, the entrance to the Lost River Cave that I've talked about several times. Uh, here you see it in 2017, uh, was out there doing a little bit of field work, took this nice picture, uh, just a, a nice, beautiful day at the cave entrance here. Um, you know, family down there about to go on a tour, uh, really nice, nice photo. And then this was two days later. Uh, the family was gone by then. They're not underwater. They're gone. Uh, but fortunately, fortunately, uh, you know, we have pretty good advanced warning understanding of when we're going to see the conditions happen because of the monitoring and the work. Uh, you know, we have real time monitoring at this site. Um, just upstream of where we are here is our blue hole monitoring site. where We've got real time water level. We, we know when it's changing, how fast it's rising, what's happening, and we can communicate that with the folks at Lost River, um, you know, and generally get an idea. But pretty decent sized event, obviously enough that it, it caused the water level to rise pretty significantly in a short amount of time. Uh, clearly no tours in the cave at this point in time. Uh, things were flooded out. And if you're familiar with the valley at all, you'll know it's a pretty deep and large size collapsed uh, sort of valley that extends uh, for a couple kilometers. If you go down valley at the, the back of the valley, there's actually another small spring that comes out uh, that's normally just a very small flow spring. And if you were back there at the time, you can see here sort of the edge of the valley. If you look in the photo closely, you can see stairs back here uh, that go up just to where the parking lot is. And there's folks out kayaking. Um, so they're probably in about, oh, probably I'd say it's eight to nine meters of water, of water over what the base flow is uh, in this type of condition. Um, which is not that frequent. We only get these a couple times every every year or two when you have this type of water level flow uh, out there. And one of the big ones we had was actually 2010. Uh, 2010 here we had a, a massive flood which instigated a lot of the work we're doing. Uh, we're monitoring water levels at different places in the cave. Um, at that point in time we had the big flood down in Nashville that also extended out to Bowling Green where we had uh, you know, massive damage, large-scale flooding, um, major rise in the water table that caused a lot of issues around the city. So here's kind of a, another look at what that was like. It was worse than this. This is another look at that 2017 flood. Um, this spring in the back, usually if, if anybody's been there, you'll know that there's a nice run and you can go down a pretty steep hill all the way to the bottom of the valley and the water had come up level, um, which is basically just, just below the level of the road, uh, the main road, it's just off screen. So the discussion question is, what are the most important data to capture relevant to water quantity? A lot of different things to consider here when we're trying to look at just water level and what happens. So for us, it's, it's partly monitoring and, and site selection. Again, we have a lot of injection wells here in Bowling Green. We've got thousands to choose from that are great for water quality, but also great for water level fluctuations. Um, great for potentiometric surface mapping, being able to get good scale modeling. So what we've done is basically integrate our water level monitoring at springs, in cave streams, surface streams and spring uh, runs, and then also in the wells to try and capture you know, some idea 
of the response of the system. And we've been doing this for about three years now to really try to understand how things are changing uh, storm to storm and season to season. And as development continues, um, we've got in Bowling Green quite a lot of development occurring in the last year alone, we've had over 12,000 new apartments built in the city. Uh, so it's pretty rapid urbanization development, which as we know, creates, creates usually some, some pretty interesting responses in the groundwater system as that starts to occur. Uh, as you change land use and you change impervious surface uh, and runoff conditions. So that's something we've been working with. In this video, so be an I'll be quiet and let this video play. This is a cool project about some of our uh, flood modeling in urban karst areas. Due to the inherent complexities of trying to simulate physical phenomena in karst environments, we've had to be very resourceful in our sources of hydrological data. And in our pursuit to better understand the mechanisms related to cars flooding, we found that class five injection wells have allowed us to peel back some layers and peek inside of the black box. So in normal fluvial environments, stormwater is commonly directed into a system of storm sewers that convey that stormwater runoff to a surface water body. Unfortunately, most karst landscapes lack the surface hydrology and topographic gradients necessary for traditional conveyance systems. As an alternative, storm sewers in karst areas often convey stormwater short distances to the nearest sinkhole or stormwater retention basin in which a class 5 injection well may or may not be located. So to facilitate better understanding about this obscure and antiquated stormwater management practice, I've created some illustrations to demonstrate the simplicity of these systems and even provided a fancy legal definition for further clarity. But essentially, it's just a straight pipe that funnels storm water into the subsurface. As you might imagine, these PMPs create a whole host of water quality issues. But because of poor siding and design, they also contribute to karst flooding, the thing that they are designed to alleviate. And when we review the literature, we find that there are three types of karst flooding, recharge flow and discharge related flooding. Recharge related flooding occurs when the stormwater runoff exceeds the drainage capacity of the car's feature or injection well. Likewise, flow related flooding occurs when the incoming flow rate exceeds the flow capacity of the conduits in the aquifer. Now in this example, we have water flowing into the system from additional inputs as well as the injection feature. The flow capacity is exceeded causing the water to rise and then surcharge. Finally, discharge related flooding occurs when the groundwater discharge is reduced due to increased water levels at discharge points. In this example, I illustrated in the in obstruction just to demonstrate the point. But understanding the type of flooding is essential to solving the problem. However, karst is widely heterogeneous and dynamic in nature and that complicates things because you don't have a one size fits all solution. This is particularly problematic to local, state, and federal governments because traditional flood management strategies are often ineffective. It also doesn't help that karst flooding doesn't typically occur along perennial water courses, which is a major reason it often goes unrecognized. Now that we've covered some background information, we'll segue to our study area and monitoring setup. The city of Bowling Green, Kentucky, like other urban karst areas, uses class five injection wells to lessen the severity of flooding. To date, over 2,000 injection wells have been drilled in the city. However, our primary focus in this study is a five square kilometer groundwater basin in the northwestern portion of the city. The groundwater basin was chosen because it contains large residential areas prone to flooding and comparatively the size of the basin is manageable for data collection and analysis. We started the study in 2017, and at the beginning of the project, we installed a full weather station, pressure transducers and 31 injection wells, and a gauging station at the outlet spring for the basin. All of the data loggers used in this study record data continuously at one minute resolution. So in this first example, I wanted to show you one of our well monitoring setups and some downhole footage of one of our sites. In each injection feature, a ceiling well was installed and a pressure transducer is used to monitor groundwater fluctuations. I've also included an illustration of a data logger as well as a schematic for one of our deployment setups. The next example is one of our weather stations. 
The station is equipped to measure precipitation, temperature, relative humidity, barometric pressure, cell radiation, wind speed, and wind direction. The station uses cellular telemetry and reports all of these values real time. I've included a video over dashboard for demonstration purposes. Finally, the last example is our monitoring station at the Alloa Spring, which is also equipped with cellular telemetry so we can monitor water level and discharge real time. I've also included uh, another screen grab of a different dashboard for demonstration purposes. Over the last few years, we've gained a lot of great information regarding karst flooding and the influence of class 5 injection wells on urban karst hydrology. For instance, monitoring resolution is extremely important. For us, we discovered that one minute resolution is necessary to accurately capture peak water level. Additionally, we also learned that many of the monitored wells are influenced by the hydraulic connectivity of upgrading injection wells. Other findings that we discovered in the first phase of this project, we realized that flooding is primarily controlled by storm intensity rather than volume. Moreover, high intensity, short duration events result in flooding more often than low intensity, long duration events. It should also be noted that aquifer response to injection well recharge is highly variable and almost entirely dependent on antecedent conditions. And the differences in well responses may be attributable to karst aquifer heterogeneity. In this first phase of the project, we were able to create three-dimensional potentiometric surface maps for observed events. However, from a planning standpoint, we need more than that. Over the monitoring period, we haven't experienced storm events with rare return periods. And from our data, we know that antecedent moisture conditions play a deterministic role in flood response. Moreover, effective hazard management necessitates that we model and simulate a multitude of events under differing initial conditions to ensure adequate protection. In order to predictively simulate the response of the karst aquifer to a defined set of conditions, we've opted for an approach that utilizes artificial neural networks. If you're unfamiliar with neural networks, they are essentially just a form of machine learning algorithm with a structure roughly based on that of the human brain. We chose this methodology to avoid the pitfalls of physics-based deterministic modeling techniques. Neural networks are not as computationally demanding. They can infer unseen associations on unseen data and have the ability to learn and model nonlinear and complex relationships, which is particularly useful in karst environments. Unlike many other prediction techniques, artificial neural networks do not impose any restrictions on the input variables, which allows improved accuracy when dealing with data with high volatility and non-constant variance. So I created the shallow network diagram of one of our site models for additional clarification. I thought it would be easier to explain the process if we examine the model on an individual level rather than at base and scale. I won't go into detail on specific model architecture, but I would like to briefly discuss the conceptual idea behind the selected inputs. And I would like to qualify that statement because all the model inputs were chosen through a process that involved dimension reduction, normalization, lag compensation, and cross-correlational analysis. So from a mechanistic standpoint, the determined inputs make sense. Obviously, the accumulated precipitation parameter is the primary driver in the hydrograph response. So the moisture variable covers our antecedent conditions. And then finally, the outlet spring discharge acts as our base level control. Now, all of these inputs are fed into the model to approximate peak water elevation for the particular monitoring site. I deliberately only used open source materials to construct the model. This was done so that the source code and methodology could be easily altered and used by anyone. I coupled PyTorch, which is Python's machine learning library, with IBM Watson computing services. What you see now is a graphical user interface of the model. The model was trained using millions of data points, but for this particular example, I'm inputting measured storm conditions that the model was not trained with. This storm occurred in February of 2018. I would like you to keep in mind that we can simulate multiple time steps using a JSON import, but for now I'm just showing you a single input for simplicity's sake. Now that we have our peak water level, let's see how that compares to our measured water level. As you can see, the model is fairly accurate, and this example is less than a centimeter off the measured value. As a further application, I used ArcGIS services to create a three-dimensional model of the site, as well as a flood map from the peak water level data.
So we should still have some time if anyone has any questions. Thank you. All right, so thanks to Adam via video and Adam also here virtually. Um, does anybody have any questions, comments, or, or discussion points for some of the water monitoring and water level work that uh, was described in the video? See so one chat question. So somebody mentioned thousands of injection wells over what spatial extent? Um, so we have about 2,580 or so documented injection wells just within inside the city limits of Bowling Green, which is about 39 square miles, a little over 100 kilometers square. So a fairly dense amount of injection wells in a small area. Um, and probably more than that, those are not including probably several that we have not actually documented that uh, are a little bit more difficult on private landowner uh, wells and whatnot where we can't actually always get the data unless it's been reported. Don't see or hear anything else, so we'll just keep moving along. We're right on time for our workshop. We're gonna get a little bit deeper into some of the data management as well. So we're gonna talk about some of that and go deeper into some of the things mentioned in the video and otherwise. Um, so a big question is, you know, are there software gaps for processing and addressing urban karst hydrology data? Um, it's something that we've noticed a lot. I think Adam did a great job talking about open source software and modeling data and things that are not commonly used as much. Um, we have a lot of different types of modeling data that have been used for all sorts of different types of hydrology. Obviously the application in karst environments, uh, particularly urban karst environments has not been as, as quite uh, focused on and evolved over the last few decades as other more standard, more common types of, of hydrologic models. So uh, we've been really working more and more to try and, and work that together uh, to see how that all comes together uh, for us and being able to, to use these new types of models and these new types of, of approaches uh, with machine learning and neural network models and things that adapt. Um, good question is, is, as the injection wells continue to increase and do we see things change and all? That's the great new news in the way we use this model is that it's easily adaptable um, as we see things change. Uh, what we wanted was something that would be fluid and simple where you would not have to go back in and recreate the model from scratch every time you would see a, a new batch of wells or some conditions that would change from land use or otherwise. So the nice thing about this is it can be updated and managed fairly quickly and easily because it's so adaptive. So we'll talk about some of the software for our, and we'll kind of bounce back and forth water quality too. Uh, for the EXOs, we use something called Core EXO, great easy software to use to bring the data in from the sound. For our hobos, we use Hoboware Pro, great, again, easy interface. You can do some preliminary graphing. You can bring in the data and, and do a little bit of, of analysis and conversion in, in the software itself. Uh, EcoWatch, another software we use for certain things. Uh, so lots of different software is used to get the data from the songs. We bring that in and then we do some, some simple conversions to most all the data. Uh, on average, again, we're bringing in hundreds of thousands of data points every week. Um, a, a small army of grad students and, and staff process and work on those to keep them up to date. We bring them in, we typically do a Julian date time transform. So we get everything on a, a uniform time step. We'll go through and do uh, some simple barometric pressure compensation. Uh, so these are, are not vented loggers that we use for these, these hobo pressure transducers. So we have to actually do a, a correction for barometric pressure uh, that's in the atmosphere versus what types of pressure measurements we're getting from the water level loggers uh, underwater. So we actually do a quick conversion for that compensation. So we get an accurate uh, water level measurement uh, based off of that uh, compensation conversion. And then we do, you know, some more with that uh, to, to basically ensure that uh, we have accurate data. Uh, so we have to make sure we, we account for local site characteristics as well as regional. Uh, so a lot of times we have to have different barometric pressure uh, measurements, which a lot of our, our rain gauge and weather station sites we do. Um, it can change quite a bit from one site to the next. So we continue to try to, to improve that as much as possible. And then we also do a bunch of calibration corrections. So we do a lot of different work um, trying to calibrate our actual water quality sons, our exos, to make sure everything looks good. Here you see uh, conductivity raw data in the graph uh, for an exo where we have two different exos, both measuring simultaneously every, every 10 minutes, the uh, conductivity data. And you'll see here, obviously, there's a lot of, of anomalies and those are typically points where we pulled the sonde out to do the calibration. And so you get these, these 
straight lines that indicate obviously um, bad data or poor data that aren't water quality recordings. And then you see some of the other, other uh, sort of disconnects there that are part of the, the need for calibration. Here you see a corrected graph where we've actually combined together our calibration data, um, identified which, which one of those uh, decreases you see are actually from real measured events versus calibration or when the song was out of the water. And then we have a nice clean, accurate data set. And then we bring all these in to do additional analyses to actually do graphing and statistics using different softwares. Uh, one we use quite a bit is SigmaPlot um, from Sysdat. It's a great package. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's pretty powerful for large sets of data. Um, but even for us, not quite powerful enough for all the data we collect as far as just management and storage. Um, we use SPSS for a lot of the data storage aspects to be able to pull in data to our different softwares for analysis. Um, again, just because there's so much of it, uh, millions and millions of data points. And so now the software we probably use the most, it's used by, by quite a, a few different entities and government agencies and whatnot is uh, Origin Pro. So Origin Pro is a, a great software for us to be able to do all the things we need to do because it has an incredible analytical side uh, where you can do coding and you can do programming and transforms and things on um, large data sets. You can, you can process uh, massive batches of data and you can also do a lot of good visualization. You can do stacked graphs, you can do a bunch of statistical analyses. Um, so it's really powerful on the processing side, but also on the graphing and visualization side. Um, it's something that we, we recommend and we've used quite a bit uh, recently as our sort of go-to for everything. And then we do calculations in that for things like discharge to make our rating curves, uh, which we talked about. Uh, we do evapotranspiration calculations set up and automated uh, from our weather station so we can actually use evapotranspiration to compensate uh, for some of the things we see in our hydrographs and whatnot when we're doing analyses. And then we use uh, programming quite a bit, um, both for some of the, the software now, or some of the data analysis we use the software for, but also for things like automation. So we actually automate a lot of our data processing where we can pull in the raw data off of the SON directly and then it will automate the processing to do some of these conversions and calculations and things into a master file sheet where it's available and useful then uh, to process and analyze as a final data set. Um, so Adam's done an incredible job automating a lot of this process and including implementing QAQC sets. So we have QAQC on all the data uh, we go through and we can actually double check everything um, as we process it through to make sure there are no errors, either from human error or from any kind of data processing errors. And that's for all of our sites, for all of our, our data that comes in uh, to do um, consistent QAQC random checks that we do. Uh, we institute a lot of data quality control to make sure that everything is accurate and useful. And then again, with some of the statistical analyses and modeling, we use a lot of different things, um, a lot of IBM software, um, a lot of different R and Python coding, uh, Mathematica, MATLAB, um, a lot of stuff done in GIS, obviously, for mapping, moving things through. So there are quite a different uh, set of suites. We also use some other, other visualization software like Grapher, which is great for some advanced graphs. Um, Surfer, there's a bunch of different ones that we use for, for this. So it takes quite a bit more on the back end uh, once you actually have the data. Any discussion on any of that stuff or questions anybody has? Don't see any. Hi, this is uh, Kurt Health. Yeah, hi, Kurt. Hi, I'm interested uh, to know, do you guys have um, any protocols or SOPs that you'd be willing to share regarding your data processing? Sure, yeah, we've got lots of SOPs actually for our data processing. Um, we have SOPs and things set up pretty much for uh, all, of the, all of the different uh, types of songs and instrumentation we use and for the processing side for how we actually do some of the basic conversions, everything from just a Julian day time conversion to, to some of the more advanced stuff. So um, yeah, we're actually working on a way to try to make some of that available and, and some of these different templates and things on uh, our website, which I'll talk about here shortly. Um, we're definitely all about the sharing here. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to get a look at some of those SOPs, uh, the mouth waters, so to speak. No, for sure, happy to. And, I wish, wish I'd have had those when I was a grad student for some of these things, um, but we've gotten smarter now that we actually start to, to record and document these things and we figure them out instead of just leaving them out there for somebody else to figure out later. But yeah, for sure, we'll be happy to share some of those. So, no problem. 
I'll move on to the next piece here, which is uh, basically going to talk a little bit about products and outcomes and some of the outreach education. So some of the things we, we achieve through this work. So one of the things we start with are what are the goals and expected outcomes? Um, it's great to go out and collect all these data points, millions of data points. What do we do with it all? Um, we've kind of worked backwards where we started collecting data and then got to the point where we started to realize what we might actually be able to do to more strategically collect our data and streamline some of the, the ways that we do things for intended goals and outcomes. So here's just a flow through of sort of what we do with some of the data as it comes in. It has all the different parameters that we monitor for for these real-time sites. And that includes things like water level, temperature, pH, specific conductivity, and other parameters for water geochemistry and water quality. And we scroll through and, and process all these data as they come in and we use them to create different things like maps of the, the different hydrology and the water levels and the types of geochemical and water quality parameters that we can map throughout the city. And as we continue to process through these data, we also will take them and graph them up with other types of parameters like meteorological conditions, like rainfall amount, surface temperature, wind, et cetera. And we'll be able to put those together to get a really good idea of how rainfall events affect the water quality and water levels here at Bowling Green. So as we process through those data, we have literally millions of data points a year that we bring in and we process through from our real-time monitoring stations. As we create those different data sets, we can then produce really nice graphs like these, where you can see over time, this is one month or one site in March, how the different water quality parameters and water conditions change. And we use those for research and also for informing the public about any potential issues or threats. So a little redundant, but shows you a little bit what we have going on there for uh, sort of our flow through of work process. So here's a scroll through of our monthly report. So we actually submit these to the city of Bowling Green, um, where you can see here, it's kind of a final output report. So every month for every site, uh, we go through and do these reports that summarize the data, do um, descriptive statistics on the sites, uh, talk about the maintenance and calibration and everything that we've done at each site and everything that was done sort of week to week, uh, quarterly, monthly, et cetera, depending on which month it is in, in the report. And so we try to do this to really keep good notes on this. And uh, as you're doing multiple sites over multiple years with lots of different projects and various students, um, we found it's incredibly important to have these records, um, whether it's for documentation of a project that would be something that might actually need it legally or for just good data management and, and metadata for thesis research and whatnot. Uh, so these are really useful and, and I think really helpful for our students. We get a lot of benefit out of doing these types of reports um, on the professional side and understanding a lot about how they, they collect the data and what they do with it in the processing side and why it's important to know step by step that we have good notes from the field, good calibration, good QAQC, and obviously can produce quality data on the outset. And so just some analysis and visualization to tie back some of the things you've seen already in the videos. Um, through all this data collection, we're able to do a lot of interesting, cool things. Um, we're able to do some groundwater fluctuation modeling, uh, potentiometric surface mapping, um, some really good storm response analysis at really high resolution. Um, again, we found that resolution makes a difference. Some good three-dimensional flood mapping. This is a map over here on the right. This colorful one of Lost River uh, Cave and Valley. So it's a map of where you saw some of those flooding videos. And where we have our blue hole monitoring site um, and then the, the cave tours down here. So we wrote a map out. The actual volume of the flood, um, you can see it's in the millions, millions of gallons. Uh, millions of liters stage of uh, that particular event. So that was kind of interesting and nice because we had really good control of water level elevations at multiple points within that, that basin. And here you have a kind of interesting comparison. You have three different panels of graphs uh, that show you the top three are actually the well hydrographs for all of our, our 30 wells within that study that was in the video that Adam narrated. And you have it at one hour, 10 minute and one minute resolution. And then below you see an actual spring hydrograph for, for that, the outlet spring, uh, where you can actually see the responsiveness to it, again, at hourly, 10 minute and one minute resolution. And so what we've really been able to tell here is that you can tell easily by looking at the graph, the difference you get in resolution and the flashiness and some of the responsiveness of these systems in the, the different types of data capture. So one minute clearly giving a whole lot more resolution to certain things. Uh, that we would be interested in when it comes down to flooding or potential water quality uh, pulse events uh, that would come through versus a, a 10 minute or one hour. And here is uh, sort of another diagram of the model he showed. This is a static image of it. This is 
again, showing groundwater fluctuation and flooding occurring uh, in this basin where these wells are. And this is over only about 30 minutes of time. So you can see just the responsiveness in 30 minutes uh, of the change in potentiometric elevation and the water level over such a short amount of time in such a small basin just due to the, the responsiveness of the system because of all the injectable inputs that, that really efficiently drain it, uh, which also really efficiently allow it to flood and sort of back flood and surcharge out of the wells when we get the right size event. And here's another graph showing you also uh, the difference here between weekly data and 10 minute data um, at our, our Lost River site. You see here precipitation on the top of the graph uh, and on the one on the left over here you have these X's which represent weekly values for, for discharge. And you can see some fluctuation and variability, um, but you don't get quite the resolution you do at 10 minute, where you can see much more clearly a distinct base flow. You see a, a sort of nice response and recession of you know, intense rain events and the responsiveness. And what's really interesting what we see here, um, and what's, what's nice at the higher resolution that you don't capture, and I think something's important, I saw George Vanny mention this the other day in one of the, uh, the uh, sessions was looking at, at the recession and looking at some of the things, you know, outside of the storm events that are also important. Here we notice we have quite a few rain events that occurred where we got no response really in our, our discharge. Um, so we know a lot of that water is going into storage. We know it's, it's being altered and changed in the flow paths or maybe not even making it down into storage due to, to a lot of the impervious surface in the urbanized portion of Bowling Green. Um, so it's important for us to be able to document those conditions just as much as it is the big storms and the things that we're obviously always curious about. Uh, they're a little more exciting. So, so uh, somebody just asked about water quality. I'll be happy to talk about that. Um, it's interesting because we've just now started to be able to collect really good water quality data uh, for things outside of standard. Um, I will give a caveat that, that in our basic water quality data collection for things like pH and, and turbidity and whatnot, um, they're great proxy indicators. Nothing's as good as getting actual direct good water quality samples for, for all the things you really are, are curious about. Here you see a year's worth of weekly water samples at, at 10 different sites that include some in-cave streams, a few of those injection wells, um, a couple other of our, our groundwater sites. So in total, these are showing numbers exceeding the actual uh, regulatory limits for water quality. So we've got E. coli over here. Um, this is by percent. So basically out of a, a year's worth of weekly samples, you know, we're looking at somewhere in the, the 80s to 90s percent of the time we're exceeding the, the drinking water standard of zero for E. coli. Um, fluoride, we're doing pretty well, really. Just one well, it was pretty bad. Uh, iron, not so bad. You know, not a major water quality concern. Lead a little bit more so. There we're seeing exceedances, uh, you know, 15, 20, 30 percent of the time. Uh, chloride, Really nothing too crazy there. We use that as an indicator for things like uh, street runoff and other inputs. Arsenic, however, we do see that we're again back in the 20 to 30 percent range of the time at these sites. Um, ubiquitous at all the sites where we're exceeding these levels. So a little more indicative in things you can't get at a 10 minute resolution with a, a water quality song, but ways that we're trying to do things now are for the next step are creating these large suites of data so we can actually go back and look at ways to use the proxy analyses. So things like looking at TSS as a proxy for E. coli, uh, if you capture data at the highest resolutions, and then potentially for some of these other water quality indicators, that's something we're working on now. And, and even working with Fonderstorm and some of these different aspects to do testing of new probes and things that might work as proxy indicators for these types of water quality data that you can't get as easily uh, without doing a lab analysis test. And here's E. coli is an interesting one for us. Again, going back to resolution, um, we have the city doing ambient monitoring every quarter, which you see on the right graph over here. And at quarterly resolution at all of these sites, you see a, a fairly low number of sites that actually uh, are above around zero. You know, So you get a couple sp spikes, you get a pretty good size one here at, at New Spring, uh, around 16,000 colonies per 100 mils. At a weekly resolution for those same sites over the same exact period of time, you see here, a uh, very different picture of water quality. Uh, we catch that flashiness of things pulsing through. We capture obviously a little bit better the frequency of when we exceed uh, that standard of zero. Um, we're seeing here obviously spikes we didn't capture. Uh, it, it's some of these sites where the new spring was the high value over here, we're actually looking at bypass, we're up at over 40,000. 
um, and, and several of the sites, you know, 30, 40 weeks or more uh, where we're seeing values in the thousands or tens of thousands. Uh, so obviously resolution makes a huge difference and, and it really captures the flashy pulse nature of the, the car system. Uh, even in the urban ur urban environment, we expect it to be that way, but maybe even not uh, quite this this much and not to see quite this much bacteria coming through in a place where you'd expect there's fewer inputs, uh, where we have less ag and less uh, less septic, but still some, and, and probably leaky sewers for sure. And the last one I'll put up is the antibiotic resistance. Here are antibiotic resistant bacteria. This is uh, looking at different types of, of them. I won't go into the, the micro side of things. Uh, I'm not an expert on it by any means, but I'm fascinated by it. Um, we're looking here at percent positives by site. So we're looking at it, every site, you know, being potentially positive 60, 70, 80% of the time for at least three of these four indicator uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, so these are ones with, where we're looking at different types of antibiotics um, and looking at, at the different uh, ways that they're resistant and the prevalence of those at our sites. So long story short is that at many of our sites, we see the presence of the indicators for antibiotic resistance um, for multiple different types of bacteria resistant against multiple different types of antibiotics, uh, which is kind of a surprise and something where we're doing a lot of work in right now uh, is the next step. And another thing we developed is something we call the UCARE Toolbox. I'll go through briefly. Um, through all this, what we decided is we need to figure out how to site these locations. Um, it's, it's been sort of haphazard as we built this network of where do we put it? Well, it's convenience-based or it's kind of out of curiosity. We decided we would uh, create this urban karst aquifer resource evaluation toolbox uh, where we would actually be able to take and score different sites based on vulnerability, which is what you see here. Uh, so we characterize and score uh, different parameters of the site based on, on sort of basic things, kind of built off the karst disturbance index and some others that have come since, um, just to kind of quantify the vulnerability of a site based on observation and existing data. The next part of the toolbox is a threat score. So we go through and score the threat uh, for pollution input proximity, uh, sedimentation, population density, that sort of thing. We score that through. And then the third part of the toolbox is a monitoring evaluation. Um, how accessible is the site for monitoring? Is it already set up for, for different types of sampling uh, or get sampled frequently? Um, has it got flood monitoring? Uh, is there water level data, et cetera? So basically a way we can go through and score. And here you can see kind of an example of what it looks like. You apply it and it basically gives you some idea based on the scoring of these three tools of whether or not you should monitor at that site, how frequently you should monitor at that site, um, what types of things you might learn from that site, just to give us a quantitative and a little bit more sort of methodical way to choose the sites we actually set up these fairly expensive and elaborate monitoring sites at, um, be it for water sand installation or for uh, water quality sampling. And here's the Bowling Green where you can see we've taken all these different sites uh, and major spring features and, and uh, groundwater features and we've scored them all. Uh, we have quite a few that are up on sort of the high score, uh, which means they would be great for monitoring and important, you know, for one reason or another that the toolbox can, can give you the data on. Um, and we're all sort of in the mid range. So uh, nicely, we actually monitor quite a few of these sites already. So it works out pretty well, uh, kind of validate this, but we also picked up a couple of sites we weren't monitoring at that are, are basically set up for our future phases of this, this monitoring network. Any discussion or questions on any of that stuff before we do the last piece? I'll move on so we can get wrapped up and have time. Um, the last thing is sort of our audience and, and application of our data and what we do with it. So big thing we think about here is what do we do with all this? Uh, we started out as sort of a scientific endeavor, curiosity, interest. We start to build this network. It starts to grow. We start to collect data. We develop better methods. We start to understand more about the system and how it works and what we should really zero in on, on for, for future work. And so application is huge. Um, last year, we had a big gasoline leak in uh, Lost River Cave. Uh, started in March, lasted until July. Uh, was a big project. We had the EPA here, a lot of things going on. Um, a lot of interesting things came out of this. Uh, we obviously were monitoring. We knew there was a big storm event that happened right before this, this sort of leak or detection occurred. Um, big vapors throughout the system. We had to shut down tours. There were a lot of, of different issues outside of the, the cave where we had people who had to evacuate their homes uh, due to vapors, really sort of reminiscent of the, the 80s and, and a lot of the problems we had in Bowling Green uh, that we thought were well, well over with thanks to new regulation and being a little more aware of these things. But obviously, it's not a perfect system and, and the car system itself is always vulnerable regardless. 
Um, so we actually dug into a sink, opened up a brand new cave, a new tributary to Lost River just across the street. Um, great little sort of, of uh, epic cars type uh, entrance to it that opened to a little tiny stream. Eventually that worked into a big waterfall. Uh, we detected the product in there as soon as we entered into the, the system. We did some dye tracing to trace back to a bulk plant that was a, a little uh, distance down the road. And basically identified this whole project, um, went out, pulled the tanks, replaced them, remediated the project. Uh, you can see here the map where we connected through this, oops, connected through this new, new part of the passage. Here's the map part of the cave. The purple is the main Lost River system. So feeding into it. Um, typical karst, of course, you'd think if we die trace that it might come into Lost River somewhere here close by, but actually it skipped all that and came in down here. So about, about a mile and a half away is when we got our detection downstream. Um, so really complicated system and complicated project. Um, great cooperation, great uh, coordination, resolved it up, resumed tours, uh, haven't had any problems since. And it was nice because a lot of the data we had from the mapping, the monitoring, the water levels, you know, tracking the storm events, understanding the pulses and when we would see vapor uh, move and change in the system, all really useful data that we had that we could use to help resolve this problem. And then we also use it for education outreach. Um, our big thing here is our under BGKY. Uh, .org website, so under BG project. We have a website you can go to now under bgky.org in partnership with the city. Um, you go in there, we've got Cross, our cave crayfish mascot. You go there, you can click on uh, the website links. You can go in and see infographics uh, to look at things like stormwater and urban cars development and our partnership there. Um, we've got things on stormwater. We've got stuff about non-point source pollution uh, for education and, and use for, for anybody who's interested in the general public. And then you can actually click through to our real-time monitoring network through the website. So it'll take you to this, this dashboard uh, that's hosted out through the software we use uh, to connect to the real-time songs. You can see the green dots there where you can, you can pick a site. All those data go online to our real-time monitoring site website, which is under bgky.org, as you've seen before. And we have real-time data that come in this way for us through some of our stations. And then it gets put on the under BG website and you can see here how those data are presented, where you have a map of each station that's in the system. And then when you pull it up through the website under bgky.org, you can then see each parameter that's graphed, like temperature, connectivity, water level. And as we go through month to month, week to week, year to year, we can change and look at the different conditions and be able to use those to make real-time decisions for any types of water quality threats or flood threats or anything else that relates back to the monitoring sites through the city of Bowling Green. And I encourage. So that's a uh, site that's up. Uh, our timing is really bad because we're actually doing calibration and maintenance in the sites right now, uh, since we're already out in the field this week uh, before the semester starts next week. Um, so if you go there now, you may not actually see some of that up. Um, it comes down obviously when we're doing some of that uh, maintenance. So um, typically though, you can go there and you can, you can easily see anybody anywhere in the world, uh, those sites, which is really useful for us uh, to be able to monitor and capture things and look at stuff wherever we are uh, and help coordinate with the city or anybody else who has con uh, con questions or any kind of inquiries about the conditions at the sites at any given time or, or historically. And then we also do some educational videos. Here's a short one we did, um, kind of a fun throwback. You may remember this. It may sort of come to you as something you're familiar with if you think back to a, an old commercial that was back uh, uh, about 25, 30 years ago. Uh, so we work with the city and the mascot and we did a, a sort of a, a parody on that uh, that was shown at all the movie theaters uh, as previews before and after all the different movies uh, in the lobbies of all the movie theaters here, which we've done quite a bit uh, with the city on that for education outreach. So I'll let that play through here quickly. Visit under bgky.org to learn more. So short and catchy and uh, reminiscent of, uh, of a commercial back in the day. So all this stuff has been fantastic. Um, great partnership. We've learned a lot about a lot of things. Um, we've got uh, some great uh, recognition for it. We recognize as a model practice uh, for all these different, different interactions and uh, projects we've done with the city and the work here. Uh, to do the monitoring and some of the data collection by the American Public Works Association. 
um, and also Environmental Monitor Magazine through Fondries um, and, and folks at YSI. So it's been really nice as we've been able to put the word out and share this. Uh, our whole goal is to be able to try to improve things and make this available to people who might be interested in, and to create these partnerships and collect these types of data and to improve how we manage and how we look at uh, our ways of managing, modeling, protecting, et cetera, all the things in, in urban cars, groundwater systems that are of concern as we continue to learn more and, and build better ways through technology and also through, also through understanding uh, to hopefully continue that improving of knowledge in the ways that we address and manage these through policy, regulation, and, uh, and just best practices. So last and last, but not least, some guiding suggestions. Um, we've understood basically through this, to choose the correct resolution. Um, what we do and some of the things I suggested here are not always the best for the site or the needs you have. It's something that's obviously specific to your study, your site, your monitoring needs, your management needs, and then using the best and most appropriate technology. Again, suggestions here, there's lots of great technology and, and new things out every day. Um, I encourage people to, to think about those, explore those. Um, you can really create nice relationships with a lot of these folks at these different vendors that'll help you and allow you to, to use things and test things. Uh, we've been at great success testing and using different types of equipment. And then building a network, if you do this in a way where you're trying to build something long-term is to grow strategically. Uh, we typically add about a site a year, uh, give or take, which is plenty when it, it, you know, when you think about what you have to bring online in order to actually manage the data, the site installation, the maintenance, um, you know, too fast would be unsustainable for us. And then we also plan for longer term sampling and site maintenance. Uh, so we not only plan for the installation and site set up now, but as you build four, five, six, eight, ten of these, um, you have to maintain and continue to keep those up for as long as you plan to do it. And for us, it's, it's indefinite. So uh, we continue to, to make sure we're strategic about that and, uh, and also changing. Sometimes that means downsizing. Sometimes that means moving things. Uh, we try to be smart about it, um, but also to get good continuous data. And then data density, you know, we recently upgraded from our weather station data after we did a lot of the work looking at how spatial variability or rainfall influenced some of our data. Uh, so we actually have some, some great discharge rating curves and some other things going on that would benefit from uh, improved precipitation data. So now we've expanded the network through some really good initiatives and, and uh, funding we're fortunate to have to, to have 13. So 13 rain gauges in, in you know, 100 square kilometers is going to be intense uh, for being able to actually get incredible one minute resolution rainfall data. Uh, we'll really be able to understand and do some definitive modeling of some of the, the flood response here in the city. And then more to data always are better. So it's because we're going to do more. Uh, sometimes it isn't as helpful. Um, sometimes it's really necessary. So it's st strategic and been something we've been really fortunate to be able to play around with to know whether we need 10 minute data, one minute data, one hour data, you know, it's, it's easy to get too much and be overwhelmed. Sometimes it's necessary to have one minute resolution. Sometimes it's, it's overkill. Um, so things to think about just to consider. And then uh, processing, analyzing, visualizing, again, trying to make sure we are using the data to its best potential and to our needs for our audience and for those who will best benefit from it. Um, part scientific, part also for the community and the people who have to live here. So we're very cognizant of that and try to make sure that we do a good job of using our data uh, to its highest potential and also making it uh, digestible and visual for people of any background who can hopefully use it for whatever purpose, even just education or potentially for something a little more in depth. So that I'll say thank you and we're just about there. We've got just a little bit of time, maybe a couple of minutes for questions discussion. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the screen share there and then bring us all back here online so we can chat and discuss if there's anything that comes up. I'll check the chat here. Do you have a question? Um, so as far as data improvement and water quality over the years, uh, we've been working on that slowly. Um, it's a little hard to do at times um, because our water quality data are not as consistent for the things we'd be curious about like E. coli and other types of parameters we'd really like to look at. Um, from the ambient data we've got at quarterly resolution over the last uh, 14 years now, um, from those data we actually have been doing some, some correlation analysis and some other things to see. Um, one thing we don't see is a whole lot of, of negatives, so we're not really seeing any degradation in the data or any, any sort of spikes or increases in, in water quality issues that we would be worried about. So um, we're at best maintaining, um, you know, hopefully improving some as we continue to manage 
Um, the real-time sites we're still going through processing because it's just so much data. Um, it's taken us about a decade we've been working on this. Our first site install went in in 2012. And so we've been, been slowly upgrading and improving the network. Um, really a lot in the last two to three years, we've, we've expanded pretty quickly um, as we've been able to sort of dig into it and show proof of concept of, of the sites and their usefulness and, and the technology's improved, which means the price has also come down a little bit. But uh, each real-time station setup cost us about $30,000. And then the, uh, the well network and all that put together costs uh, roughly around 15 or so thousand initially um, every year for upkeep and site maintenance we spend about ten thousand uh, dollars for probe replacement calibrations cleaning buffers um, you know various types of things we have to do replacement of pvc so um, all in all on an annual basis it's it's a bit much but it's manageable um, as long as we we can justify it. anybody else questions thoughts comments experience Hey Jason, can you hear me? I can. Oh good. Um, my name's Tyler. I'm with the Florida Geological Survey. Um, I, I loved your talk a lot. It was real relevant relevant to things that we're looking at and thinking about. Um, I have a real specific question for you. Um, uh, how did you choose uh, the EXO2 versus like the EXO3 and the other models? We're looking at transferring from uh, some YSI 69 uh, 20s over to the EXOs and I just wondered what your thought was about why the EXO2 it may be site specific for you but and and if you use that little wiper how you like that little wiper on it sure great question so um, for us the we use XO2s primarily because um, for one it's what we started with based on the, the models available um, it's turned out to be consistent. They have a couple different models now. Um, they have sort of shortened versions. Uh, they've got ones like the, the others, other XOs that are out that will do fewer parameters. Uh, so we like this one because it allows us to have enough ports for our probes to capture all the parameters that we want. Um, if you wanted to eliminate something like one of the parameters, you could actually go with like an XO3 and it would be fewer parameters. Um, they have uh, ones that are, are shorter and more compact that, that last a little longer. Uh, for battery wise and whatnot because they measure fewer parameters so you can get dedicated ones. So if we got a couple configurations, some have started to phase out. The XO2 seems to be kind of the industry standard that's persisted for years and years uh, where you can get the most parameters uh, as long as you've got the infrastructure to put in place and everything. It seems to have you know great quality, great stability. We have no issues really with it as long as we keep maintenance up. Um, so we pretty much go with the XO2 for all our sites. You know, we do have uh, one of our sites, we have an XO3 uh, which is a little different, but does the same thing basically. Uh, for us, it's a backside interface. The nice thing about the XO2s for us is that it inter interacts really well with the, the NextSense V2 system. So part of it is what you want to use it for. If you're using any kind of real-time telemetry, there are differences in how they interface and what, what types of real-time telemetry you can use. Um, so the XO2 is nice because the, the system we're using is designed for it and it's got the most versatility. Uh, so we pretty much stuck with it. Um, price points come down well. Everything seems to be pretty accessible. A lot of the probes being developed that are new are also meant for that, even though they, they kind of go across the platform. Um, we know that they'll work on that one because it's pretty well set up that way. So that's kind of the way we've we've you know, proceeded. But we've also looked into and explored other types of songs over the years. And, and we've tested some. And we used to use the 6920s and even the old 600s and 600XLMs and stuff. So we've got a lot of experience with the YSI songs. They were always high quality. Um, the XOs just took it to a whole new level um, with, with all the things they can do. And now uh, the wiper is, is pretty clutch. I'd say it's a pretty important feature. They're not cheap. Uh, wiper runs about 1800 bucks. I think they're yeah. about 1800 bucks. They're expensive. Like yeah, yeah. Um, but I'd say for the longevity of the other probes and for what it does to help ensure good quality data, um, it's worth it. You know, we've definitely had songs where we've had the probe go out for a little while at the wiper probe. Um, and we can definitely see a difference in the the quality of the data coming in and some of the, the maintenance we've had to do for the probes uh, that would typically clean. So it, it really does a lot for those optical probes to keep any kind of fungus or slime or sediment and stuff from in on there, which fouls them up and causes a lot of work on the back end. So I'd say, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty solid addition to it. It's worth the money, at least in our experience. Thank you for your thoughts. Appreciate it. Great talk.
Sure, I appreciate it. So, and we've used these XOs in other environments too. We use them in these sites, which are sort of more spring and, and what well sites, but we've had them in Mammoth Cave deep down and in some serious stuff. We've had them in a couple other sort of in cave waterfalls and streams. So we put them through the riggers pretty intensely in some serious environments outside of the things they were probably meant to do, at least according to the Fondries folks. Uh, they're meant for good ocean deployments and things which are pretty intense, but um, I think cave environments might be a little bit more intense because the sedimentation and stuff you don't get in the oceans that we've, we've put them through. And uh, so far they've always held up. We've always gotten great data, so it's worked out well.